All right. So our next panel is what we've been waiting for um, and what we've been really, really proud of uh, to present. And we believe that they're going to close us right. Um, it's going to be a panel for our students, panel where our students talk about their experience um, being in Burundi, you know, the traveling to Burundi and collecting stories along with um, faculty and research folks from NEIU and, uh, and the research team, pretty much. So I invite Dr. Sharon Bathia, who will be leading and moderating this discussion, and our fabulous students to the stage. One. Share two. Hello, everybody. And this is the treat of the whole trip for me. <laughs> um, we ventured on this journey to Burundi to um, study genocide with these amazing students. Um, I think I, talk, I talked about earlier in my first talk to, um, it's one thing to be a researcher and do this work and be passionate about this work, but then to take students who have never done the work mostly, who had no clue what they were getting into, and to watch the grace and courage and kindness and love and nurturing of our students and what they did as they collected these amazing stories from Burundi. Victor, can you join us? You have to join us. <laughs> so um, I'm gonna get right to it because we don't have much time. And um, as um, Victor, his work has been um, displayed, the brilliant work that he did over to the library, he's gonna join the stage because this is our family now, we're all family now, it's our Burundi family. So I want to get right to it. I think joining us also is Jacinia. Um, unfortunately, she is having some health issues, but she's going to join us, um, right? Yes, via um, Zoom. I'm here. <laughs> ah, there you are, there you are. So I present to you um, our fabulous students, Jacinia, Colette, Camilo, Katina, Crystal, Sarah, Victor, and Destiny Davis, who's the baby of our trip. <laughs> she probably wouldn't like that call that, but she was the youngest on our trip, who was absolutely fabulous. After, um, ran out, so hopefully somebody's checking on her. She's not feeling too well, so hopefully she'll be back before we're done with this. So I want to get right to it. Um, First, I'm going to ask you quickly to introduce yourself quickly, like your program you're in, and give a quick statement of why you chose to be a part of this project. I'm going to start with you, Jacinia, if you can hear us, if you can come on. Sure. Jacinia Garcia. Um, I am a student in the social work program at the master's level um, under Director Isatu Ibrahim. And... It is amazing to see all of you. I miss you all. So, and I am so proud of all the work that we have done. So, um, do you want me to say how I feel about this trip or save it until we all introduce ourselves? Well, you know what? Let's have everybody introduce yourself and we'll come back right back to you. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Right. To my left. Hello, everyone. My name is Colette. I am an MAT SOL student and I'm not really sure why I wanted to embark on this endeavor, but I am truly grateful and humbled by the experience. And there is something very powerful in finding the beauty in healing and trauma. And I just feel very fortunate that I was able to experience this with such incredible people. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Camilo Saavedra. Um, I make part of the MBA program here at NEIU, and um, 
I started working with Janine six months ago, and it's been an amazing experience. I've been able to learn from her so much and um, get involved in something I never imagined myself getting involved with. And um, it's been an amazing journey and an amazing um, experience. And I, I feel it really matters to bring those stories to the world. Um, and yeah, I'm very grateful to be here. Hello, I'm Katina Cole. I'm a master's student under the direction of Dr. Isitu as well. And initially, uh, I saw an email in NEIU announcing study abroad trips. So that's what piqued my interest, but I'm not exactly sure why I joined, but I'm glad <laughs> I did. <laughs> I'm Crystal Bunton. I'm in the Masters of Social Work program also. And the reason why I joined was because I wanted some experience with global social work as well as global research. Um, my name is Sarah Faulkner. I'm a Chicago public school teacher. I am working on my TESOL endorsement and I had the lucky fortune to have Janine as my professor and hear about Burundi. And then she told me about this opportunity and I was over the moon and also not prepared, but it was amazing. <laughs> Amahoro, as the Kirundi people say, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Victor uh, Grosimowski. Uh, I am a graduate student in uh, human resource development. Uh, my interest to join this program uh, stemmed from the fact that I am interested in learning and how learning is structured. Specifically for this trip, what led, what was the historical con context for leading to this um, uh, horror happenings, uh, aside of the, um, um, uh, obviously, photography. Okay, thank you. So next we're going to go down the line and just have our students reflect on their experience talk about some things that stuck out for them. And so you can hear through their eyes and words. Some, and, and this just scratches the surface, right? This just scratches the surface. And um, we look forward to, and I'm honored to actually listen to them reflect through this. So we're gonna start with Jacinia. Sorry, I was muted. Good oh. afternoon, everyone. Um, well, there's, I think I only have two minutes and I can talk more than two minutes about how this trip really changed my life. Um, Burundi was a life-changing experience. It is a country that has been victimized and challenged by conflicts, wrought by civil war and genocide. Um, a country of extreme poverty, but going there and hearing the stories of genocide survivors, the silent tears that held the most pain, to see the resilience of the Burundian people, their humbleness and the smiles of children really stayed imprinted in me. And I can say that this experience, I have learned so much from my team, from global social work. And my hope is that the beautiful people of Burundi can find healing and reconciliation and as a social worker, I hope that I can help those people to tell their stories and no longer be silenced, that I can be the voice of those who unfortunately cannot speak anymore, and to help those that have been oppressed and for hopefully a better tomorrow, and to continue to advocate for human rights. And I want to thank everyone, my team, for such an amazing, beautiful opportunity. I'm just going to ask you a question, just extend it. Could you um, name something that impacted you the most? Give you a little more in two minutes. You showed up for us. Uh, it would be two things. It was the stories I heard of resilience, of pain, of how they had endured all this pain, but had a good heart. They still wanted Burundi to... They wanted their families to be happy. They wanted to find healing. Unfortunately, sometimes silence is not all bad and they wanted to keep some sort of silence so that things wouldn't get worse. They had a lot of hope. Um, 
their strength was amazing. I think I held myself a lot of times to not cry. And I still do just thinking about a lot of the horror stories that they had encountered. And just, I don't know, just sitting in the bus sometimes when we travel, the smiles of children, of people, their humbleness, they're saying hi, the kindness, it really stayed in me, regardless of all the violence that they have endured, just to see how humble and kind they were. They deserve the healing. Thank you so much. And um, it was an honor and a pleasure having you with us on this journey. Thank you, Jacinia. We're going to go down to the end and have um, Victor reflect a bit on his trip, <laughs> what it meant to him, the impact it had on him, and anything that stood out for him. Um, thank you, Dr. Batia. I thought I have uh, most time to prepare for it uh, before everyone. Um, I am much better with pictures. I'm not as good as with words, but um, there's plenty that I want to say uh, when it comes to uh, our trip in Burundi. Um, 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 uh, w w there are many favorite things about it. Uh, I do want to say one of the most impactful and one of my favorite things was the morning discussions. Um, Dr. McAlpin, Dr. Mattia, uh, Dr. Ibrahima, Dr. Simeone, just listening to those uh, discussions in the morning while we were having breakfast, um, learning more about the history of Africa, uh, his, history of African diaspora, history about Burundi. Uh, for me, that has been um, 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 amazing. It has been almost like a course. Um, um, I, I do come from a region um, uh, which has been torn by wars. Uh, I'm born in former Yugoslavia. And the region um, itself went through, um, uh, sadly, a lot of wars and um, uh, genocidal episodes. Um, one of the reasons why I was drawn to this trip was to um, 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 learn um, about um, Burundian suffering through the years. Um, and uh, this has been by far one of the most impactful uh, trips for me. Uh, I'm removing myself from a position of a photographer. Um, I'm putting myself as a student, someone who came there to to learn. Um, 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 the topography of Burundi is something that I've never seen before. Um, uh, the green is much greener. The orange is much orange, <laughs> more orange. Um, uh, I know we went there in the rainy season and everything is uh, intensified. Um, but I think it added to uh, it added spice to um, um, our. Um, uh, exploring. Um, I do have a couple of notes I want to mention that um, um, luckily um, um, I have written from the trip in Burundi that I'm just opening now and one of them says um, um, the solution is to forgive. Uh, those are the last words from the speech that uh, Father Zachary gave it to us um, when we went to visit uh, the Buddha uh, monastery and uh, when he was explaining the story about Buddha massacre. Um, and that stood to me um, as uh, probably one of the Im most impactful takeouts as um, Burundi as a country who went through so much horror through its history, um, um, they, uh, witnessing and living through them, the only way to go forward is to to forgive. Uh, and for me, to for someone who went through that and to come forward and say that it, it takes it takes a, a, a big, big heart. Um, I also uh, mentioned earlier a few um, uh, words about the process of taking photography and uh, taking photos uh, in, in an area which is, um, or I'd say in um, um, spaces where there is so much um, darkness and, and horror. Um, for me, as someone who takes photos in a more, um, 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 I'd say, uh, more mainstream context, this has been a challenge. Um, um, and I'm talking mainly from a part of uh, being, uh, making sure that I'm respectful to the people around me, but also people, um, the local people, uh, the uh, Burundian people. Um, and um, it makes me happy that the feedback from the exhibit as of now has been positive. Um, there is 
additional layer of uh, difficulty when we're trying to um, 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 present this. And I know in few occasions, Dr. McAlpin mentioned it's important. Narrative is important. So my narrative with this exhibit is to showcase it as um, educational and as um, informative for the people that come and see it. Burundi um, has gone through a lot, but not many people know about it. So I think now it's time for us to start talk um, louder on this topic. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Victor. Um, I want to comment just a second too on our kitchen in our culture. We call those kitchen table talks, right? And um, every morning, kitchen table talks. Everybody's sitting around drinking their freshly brewed ginger tea, like freshly brewed ginger tea and breakfast, and getting this wealth of information. And you gave us just as much as you talk about the kitchen table. That's what a kitchen table talk is, right? It's about people sitting down, being each other's medicine. I think that's what got us through some of the the hard times. Thank you, Victor. Next, we have Colette, and she will give us her reflections. Hi, everyone. Um, as you know, I traveled to Burundi in 2023 with GRAD, and um, previously to studying abroad, I had spent about a year and some change researching and writing about this horrific mass atrocity. Um, one of my professors, Dr. Gina Wells, actually was the one that introduced me to Janine. And fast forward, and here we are. Um, I felt that I had a general sense of what to expect because I had submerged myself in so much research. And I had conducted interviews, and I had spoken to the students that went on the trip previously. So I had a very um, false sense of confidence going into this. Um, and nothing can really prepare a person for this level of evil, especially when we were visiting the mass graves. I personally, from my perspective as a student and a human, I, um, I was overcome with a myriad of emotions and it took me a while to process that. And so today I would like to share with you a very personal reflection um, that came in the form of a poem. Um, and it helped me process the complexities of what we experienced as students and as humans. Um, I do wanna take this moment to say that the images that I'm about to share with you that were taken um, on our trip by Victor are graphic. Um, they are, of course, educational, and they are not intended to be exploitive. However, they are graphic in content. So if you need a moment to remove yourself from the situation, please do so. Or if you need a moment to gather yourself, please do so. Um, my first reflection is from our trip to the mass graves in Bhutan. A small speckled bird burrows its way in and out of bright green moss around a massive hole in Buta. This tiny fragile bird chirps and playfully weaves in and out of earth, unbothered by the location, unbothered by the history, unbothered by the fact that the sun that it soars in is the same sun that others suffer in. The Truth and Reconciliation Committee of Burundi reports an estimated 523 people, some dead, some tortured, some alive, were all thrown into this very spot where the speckled bird sings. 523 lives tossed into this earth, eight meters long, five meters wide. The bird is more vocal than the people in Buta. The bird is freer than the people in Buta, and they will never get to spread their wings and enjoy the sunshine. Behind this mass grave stands a modest building, and there's yellow and blue curtains pinned delicately above the windows. Crossing this threshold, you can feel the warmth from the outside world transform into a heavy darkness. 
the representative from the Truth and Reconciliation Committee gestures to the dust-covered white vinyl bags that stack on, on, under a window. He quietly tells us to brace ourselves. As the zipper bites through the silence of the room, the opening in the vinyl bags reveals the remains of an entire community. We all brace ourselves for impact, to see this hidden horror that we will never ever be able to unsee. And as for that speckled bird, that's how I felt before coming here. Bags of human remains, bags of clothing, bags of jewelry, lives reduced to bags labeled with a black marker. Did they label the bags before or after they put this community in there? How can they drag a marker across a tibia? How can nearly 600 humans just be preserved in this small building? A chalkboard rests against the back wall and it is filled with notes and thoughts and ideas completely unrelated to this atrocity. And it's hard to see that these handwritten notes live on even though the lives below it have been erased. A tin roof, a soft breeze, and a dusty floor shelter the evidence of the 1972 genocide of Burundi. And I couldn't help but feel that I have never related to a small, freckled little bird so much in my life. This next reflection is from the area in Gatega that we visited where more human remains were kept. Black iron curtain rods and soft fabric, a red clay floor. This time, I think that I know what to expect, but it's far worse. The bodies are stored and categorized by parts as if they are hidden inventory somewhere in the back of a store. But the thing is, nobody wants to go back there. Nobody wants this inventory to be identified because this is not inventory. This is the pulse and the heartbeat of an entire culture, reduced, destroyed, deconstructed, skulls on one shelf, femurs on another, socks filled with dirt and bones from the victim's feet, the feet that they were forced to use to walk their souls to their death, belts, rope, vinyl bags, there are more bones than resources in this country. Remains unnamed, identified, and unspoken. Happened a long time ago, right? Never again, we say. But how many times can we say never again? A person's first love lays in this deconstructed heap upon a wooden shelf. A daughter's father who will never meet his grandchildren a person's uncle who encouraged them to continue their education. They're nameless, simply sorted by anatomical categories. Why? Never again, we say, but how can we look at a mourning mother in the eyes and say never again when her son's severed head was found by a riverbank in 2023, more than 50 years after this atrocity? We cannot say never again because it has never stopped. My last reflection is about a mass grave that we visited that was under a pear tree. A woman cultivating her corn found a skull on the land. And while many were too fearful to share their gruesome discoveries, this woman was brave. Near the skull, more human remains were revealed. There were so many bones popping out of the earth that it was like a roots of a tree. And it almost felt as if the grounds were too sad to hold this any longer. Fathers and sons, cousins and brothers piled one on top of each other like fruit in a store. 
except for fruit in a store, is stacked with care and it's stacked with precision. And these humans, these humans did not receive that same care and attention. They were carelessly tossed into this ground and sprinkled with earth as an afterthought. The depth and center of this grave is two meters, but can we ever measure the depth of this atrocity? 679 people were buried under this pear tree. Fruit can flourish and grow and have value, but somehow the people that were brutally massacred didn't, and they lay under this pear tree. A few feet away from me, I saw a beautiful little child nibbling on a piece of fruit. And I couldn't help but think how I hope his generation never becomes less valuable, less valuable than fruit. Thank you. Ooh. Now, give me a moment. Wow. Thank you, Colette. And you see why um, I'm so impressed and just love this group of students. Thank you for that. Um, mm -hmm. So next, next we have Camilla. <laughs> Look forward to it. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, it's definitely not going to be easy to talk about uh, after this really powerful um, writing by Colette. It really touched me again. <laughs> um, feels like I was just there all over again. Um, thank you so much for, for that. It's It was really, really, really powerful. Um, <clears throat> all right, so um, for, for my... Uh, reflection. Um, it's um, I will talk basically about my experience in Burundi and um, how I develop uh, some deep connections um, with the with that place uh, because of my own personal experience uh, of being born and raised in a country um, in Colombia. I'm from Colombia, and which is a country that I believe. Um, it contrasts its um, beauty and the strength of its people only with um, its conflicts as well. Um, so for, for some context, um, Colombia had been involved in a more than 50 year war that left over 200,000 dead people and 5 million forcibly removed from their homes. Um, that number includes my father and my two grandparents. Um, I grew up listening to and watching my people suffering and dying in a senseless conflict so old that most of my generation forgot what it was all about. Um, only in 2016, a peace agreement was reached between the government and the FARC, which is the largest guerrilla group in the country, um, and then ending this chapter of Colombia's history. Nevertheless, Eight years later, today, Colombia is still far from reaching peace. Um, different armed groups took over the FARC's territory and kept keep factual control over business and lands in Colombia. Only in 2023, 181 social leaders and human rights advocates were killed in the country, and close to 121,000 people were victims of massive force displacement and confinement. Almost none of the agreements signed were effecti effectively executed and no resources coming from the international community were spent to repair the victims. Today, the only thing Colombia has to show from its peace agreement is the novel price uh, of peace that was given to the former presidents for his efforts. Um, now, I've been living in the U.S. for over five years now, and I have to say that at the moment I landed in Burundi, um, I felt like I had arrived um, home. Just the smell of the fresh air, the color of the mountains, the warmth, welcome of its people, um, everything felt so familiar. 
And as the days went by, I found that more than the climate, the fruits and the beauty, they had similar of similar stories of hardships, struggles and suffering. As we interviewed the people of Burundi, I heard about the tragedies derived from decades of conflict. Uh, and I felt troubled about how little those stories seemed to affect me at the beginning. And it took me time to realize how the background, my background and the stories that I've heard from home made me numb to other people's struggles and how I had developed some sort of shell against empathy to avoid the pain of constantly being ex exposed um, to human suffering. It became normal sometime during my life and I had never realized that. After Burundian stories crossed with my own and hundreds from home, I started having an uncomfortable, an uncomfortable feeling from the familiarity of this conflict and its potential resolution. Just like the story would keep repeating itself and me and millions of others would see it and watch again, becoming numb to the reality of the people of Burundi. Um, I feel that there is much to be done to find resolution to Burundi's um, country and to, to the problems of, of Burundi and big measures need to be taken in order to repair the victims, which has not happened yet, and to prevent the repetition of atrocities. The work of the government during the past year has been commendable as they uncovered the forcibly hidden and hardest of truths in Burundi's cycles of violence. However, it still, it still feels like there is much more to do if the ultimate objective of the country is getting reconciliation. The whole process made me, made me bring up many questions that might not yet or ever have a final answer. For example, do these efforts translate to transforming people's realities? How feasible uh, would justice and reparation be and what would reparation look like in Burundi? What I saw was a country full of people willing to build and forgive. People who were always warm and welcoming, even when they were struggling. People ready to teach and learn to and from anyone. The most valuable thing I got from this trip is that now I feel connected to these people. And after many years, also connected to the people of my own country. I have a renewed desire to work for others who may need it and hope that the realities of the people who are suffering can be changed. Thank you. Next, <laughs> we have the beautiful Tina coming up to the, are you gonna stay there? Or you wanna yeah, prepare? Stay. All, right. All right, so. Do you think? Uh, my reflection is named a gift. Um, Bring the Burundian story. Continue. And it's, yes. Put the mic in front of me. Okay. There you go. And basically, my reflection is kind of makes light of all. Uh, the trauma and uh, this—I don't want to say the suffering, the 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 survival uh, of the people I experienced in Burundi, um, a beautiful country, a beautiful people. So my represent um, presentation represents a personal journey that I experienced in a not so in not so personal spaces. And everybody on this panel here knows what the not so personal <laughs> spaces are. Um, I've witnessed and taken testimonies of the horrors of genocide and the hope of reconciliation that lives in the hearts of the Hutu Tutsi clans in a country torn apart by colonization. The triumphs of the human spirit can be heard in these Burundian survivor stories. This trip has launched a paradigm shift in my thinking of wars happening in countries that we label that are so far away places that only happens to them. I found that my connection to the continent of Africa and its people, I realized I can carry the same resilience that I carry the same resilience in my DNA that they do 
Dr. Janine does, and the diaspora does. And in the beginning, there was O'Hare. <laughs> I've learned that there is a thick line between what we're told and what's happening during international flights. <laughs> um, packing was a nightmare. <laughs> um, the airplane was fun, and they fed us a lot. I was, no peanuts and cups of pop for us. Um, but seriously, the meetings before the trip could not have prepared me for what I did experience. When I arrived at the international terminal, I was so nervous that I didn't know what to do. Luckily, Crystal was already there. So seeing a uh, familiar face from the Zoom meeting was welcomed. I was unprepared for the flight, though, to the point that it made me sick. Um, but the touchdown in the motherland was nothing I was prepared for. I was told that when you return home, the soul remembers. This is true. I felt both rejoice and anger. Um, meeting with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. This was the first time that I felt I was taking part in something truly, truly important. The work being done by this team of professionals from various disciplines felt like nothing I could ever describe. Being part of a history is a gargantuan task with the implications still to be revealed. Our official escorts to sacred places were humbling. I shall never forget nor take for granted the opportunity of a lifetime. Never have I had the opportunity, ah, uh, okay. Testimony, truth and um, courage and truth. I didn't know anything about Burundi, an African country, until the opportunity was presented, me, presented to me through someone who took part in the first trip. Never in my wildest dreams had I ever conceived that I too would get the chance to go myself. As she described her experience, I imagined what the country and the people would look like. I found my imagination was not wild enough for what I encountered personally. Even during the meeting, I attended leading, the meetings I attended leading up to the trip, I could not wrap my mind around the horrors and the hope that I would encounter as I heard the stories. Witnesses to atrocities that are still vivid in the mind of those brave enough to share with strangers something so personal. Stories of, stories of a woman who's lived with these memories for over 50 years could not be expressed, could only be expressed by her lying on the floor, showing us the pain she endured. She reported not being able to sleep for years because of the nightmares and not being able to eat, and able to do anything but lie on the floor like she showed us. Prostate and rigid in her memory, she had names of all of those who helped and hindered her healing that she desperately wanted to purge. Sometimes time is our friend, but I did not have enough time to record her heartache. She did not have enough time that day to continue. I watched an unfortunate dance between author, one of the, um, the translators, and a witness. I waited in suspense while the translator found the English words from Karundi to describe what this beautiful woman suffered. From her outward appearance, there are no wrinkles. Her skin was brown and smooth, her dress, African print, and her hair held high. I was looking at royalty. Mm. But her crown had not been dislodged by the suffering. The words she said, I did not understand, but the pain I felt. She reported that her prayers kept her going. I believe her because only the grace of God could have given her the peace of mind to tell her story. I sometimes feel that I failed her because I lacked the skills to ask the questions correctly. But maybe inexperience saved us both, saved us both from the horrors that need not be spoken. I was not there to re-traumatize. Somewhere in my heart, I felt like I did. She relived those moments. The damage was redone. I also understand that prayers can be cathartic. I know that there are several types of traumas to be considered when we seek to understand what happened to her. A clear explanation of how trauma affects the body and brain. As she lay, lies on the floor, the first thing I notice is what I'm witnessing was to be called a, tra a true tra trauma response, a physical manifestation of what she witnessed. She was reliving it right there in front of me and my colleagues. Truth is as beautiful as Burundi. Mm. Truth telling can also be restorative and healing. And that's my reflection.
Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Thank you so much, Tina. Next we have, they're all so beautiful, aren't they? Um, next we have the beautiful Crystal to um, give her testimony and reflection. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to first thank all the professors that participated in this with us and for taking us and keeping us safe. Um, I also like to acknowledge that this is the month of social work month, March. <laughs> <laughs> and to say um, happy Women's Day to all the women in the audience and the world. <laughs> okay, so I just wanted to reflect on family um, because I am a caseworker and we deal with children and families. So I wanted to reflect on the families of Burundi. So my presentation, family is everything. Mm -hmm. Get this slide. Okay, that's me on the bus <laughs> trip. <laughs> I'm from Loudon, Oklahoma, and I'm a state social worker, and um, I'm an activist for justice, always. Um, as I stated, I'm from Loudon, Oklahoma, and Oklahoma is the first place where American genocide was, well, it's not the first, but it's one in history of where American genocide was conducted, and that was in Tulsa, Oklahoma with Black Wall Street, in which there was an incident where a Black male had touched a white woman. This was a very thriving community, all Black um, community where they bombed. Um, this was the first time America set bombs on a civilian community. Um, the definition of genocide has been um, discussed earlier today, um, and it was coined by Ralph Lemkin. Um, there also was some sociologists, Orlando Patterson and Claudia Card, who talked about um, genocide also. And they said it's not just mass killings and social deaths. It's the cutoff from groups, from traditions, families, and cultures. Um, some of Burundi's history, um, it was first German ruled. Um, then it was colonized by the Belgians. Um, they gained their freedom in 1962 and there was a monarchy. The genocides began from 1972 to 2015. Um, the genocide that occurred was systematic and structural genocide. Many of the families suffered in silence. My observations from the trip um, and the interviews was that um, Burundi has a strong family structure um, usually when you think of families, you think of the triad, which is the mother, the children, and the father. But in Burundi, it was more than just the mother, the children, and the father. It was the village. It was the clans. It was the providence. It was the community. Everybody is family in Burundi. Um, to be rich in Burundi, um, as stated here earlier, you had to be married to have a lot of children and then to also have cattle. Um, the interviews, um, you could see the importance of family that was expressed, um, their pride that they had in their ethnicity when they were talking to us throughout the interviews. It was so important. On our bus journeys, we saw a lot of information about families. We saw several families farming together. You could, it reminded me of Oklahoma when you would see the clothes lines and all the clothing of the family hanging out when you would ride through the communities. When we would take our bus, bus breaks, um, usually the whole community would come out and they would talk to us. They wanted to know who the Americans was in their community. <laughs> um, they would, provide us with um, goods and products and agricultural archi goods and everything. Um, Burundi has a strong ongoing family connection. And we would see also on the bus rides, the commune meetings. We would ride through and see people all gather for the commune meetings and things of like that. And it was just such a really 
um, joy to see all of the families together and everybody communing with one another. Um, also, there was um, in the interviews, um, they talked about the people who were the victims or the survivors were prominent people in their families. Um, they were prominent people in the community. They were the protectors. They were the encouragers. Um, they were the providers for the family. Many of the victims, um, because they lost that, were unable to attend school um, because of financial reasons. The people who were the victims were the nurses. They were the government officials. They were the businessmen. They were the educators. They were the clergy. They were students. They were family. They were the community of Burundi. Um, something that I kind of reflected on was that genocide, when it occurs, it changes the whole family dynamics. Your life is forever changed overall. It causes families to flee their land and their countryside that they love. Um, they also are never able to receive, never able to replace their belongings. Um, Families have to start all over again, and there is unresolved trauma and silence. As a social worker, we always look at strengths that come out of healing. Um, so I looked at the hope and the healing of the community and what I would wish for this community to have. And um, in August of 20, 20, in, in 2000, uh, there was a peace treaty that was signed for the Civil War, but genocide still continued. However, from the voices of the survivors and the victims that are still there um, from the interview, they wanted to have like a long morning, a uh, week long morning for the victims and the survivors. They want to regain their properties. A lot of them would like more education to stop the cycles from continuing. And it would be good if we could get international resources and assistance for the mental health and well being of the victims and the survivors. A quote that I um, had read from a book from the Krugers said One thing not killed in Burundi was hope. The citizens continue to hope that the world will take notice and will help them as they work to restore the decencies. Along this journey, um, I gained a family. So I will forever love and care about my Burundi family. <laughs> some of the pictures from my Burundi family. This is the beautiful country of Burundi. And thank you, everybody. <laughs> thank you, thank you. And so next we have the beautiful Sarah doing her thing. I'd like to sit there, come up, you're, you're fine there? Um, I can stay here. All thank right. you. <laughs> All right, thank you. All right, the name of my presentation is called Bringing Burundi Home, Reflections and Actions by Sarah Faulkner, and that's me. Um, there it is. Uh, okay. Unforgettable moments. Number one, listening to Father Zachary speak of the 40 young men, Hutu and Tutsis, that were killed in 1997 because they refused to separate. Number two, watching Dr. Janine Natarageza conduct an interview and connect with survivors before and after their testimonies were shared. Number three, watching Dr. Jermaine McAlpin honor the remains we saw at our first mass grave. Ashe. 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 Number four, the loving welcome from Dr. Janine's family. Number five, our first set of survivors who very patiently waited to tell us their stories. And number six, 
watching the respect and kindness that Victor gave each and every hero who shared their story for the GRAD Digital Archives. After interviewing survivors, we sat in a circle of metal folding chairs. I was so full of emotions. I felt shell-shocked and in disbelief that I was in Burundi, Africa, and also that I was given the precious gift of these stories that the world has yet to hear. Then Destiny Davis, a 24-year-old recent NEIU grad and our baby, <laughs> said with tears, anger, and disbelief in her voice, no one ever told me how beautiful Africa and its people are. No one taught me in school. No teacher ever showed me. That hit me to the core. You see, I am a Chicago public school teacher. I have been teaching brown and black children for the past 20 years. As a white woman, I am very passionate and driven to make sure these children aren't kept safe from our hideous American past, so I'm honest. Yet, I had never delved into the beauty of Africa. And why? Well, because I focused on what I knew, and I knew America's history. And I really had no idea of where to begin. I was one of those teachers that did destiny wrong. How could I do better? So I came back with a plan for my elementary school to do a week-long study of Burundi and learn about the beauty and the pain. I could lead by example for my colleagues. We had a kickoff in the auditorium with Dr. Janine. I created a teacher resource page to make it very easy for my fellow colleagues. And we did a fundraiser at the end of the week. Students paid $1 and wore jeans in the color of the Burundi flag. However, there was an ulterior motive. I want this money to go to the CRV, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Burundi. We had met with the vice president twice in Burundi, and he told us that the CRV was working with 5% of their budget and that women did not come forward singly like the men did, which you've heard today. They would only come together in groups. And he told us because of their budget loss, they had only been able to have one or two support groups for women. I thought that we could send this money to the CRV with the caveat that we wanted it to support and encourage their efforts to do more for the women and their healing in Burundi. I did a pre-survey for teachers. First question, in the past, have you felt competent when talking about Africa to your students? 41% replied somewhat and 58% not really. I don't even know where to start. Second question, when teaching about Africa, do you feel that you have been able to express the beauty of the continent for your students? 25% replied, yes, definitely. 33% chose eh, somewhat, but wasn't really sure how. And 41% said, not really. I don't know where to begin. So I wanted to zoom in. So by only studying one country in Africa as an entire school community, we could really focus on that country and not be overwhelmed by the huge continent of Africa. So Monday, the whole school was going to learn about the Burundi flag and anthem. Tuesday, geography and exports. Wednesday, art forms. Thursday, language. Friday, the sad history and genocide of Burundi. Here is one page from the teacher resource document that I created. All those pictures are linked to YouTube videos. Um, and there was also a description and the time. So teachers didn't have to go very far to figure out what met their students' needs and interest. I also provided a list of extension activities, but encouraged teachers to come up with their own. Uh, this is a video that I put together of Burundi at Cameron Elementary School and I don't really know how to play it. Um, do I press play? <laughs> or can you play? Oh, yeah. Namasada. Namasada. <laughs> Well 
Um, so I did a post teacher survey. Um, do you think your students saw the beauty of Africa during the Burundi study? Yes, I did. And we learned about the language, which I appreciated. We also discussed the genocide and the conflict between the Hutus and the Tutsis and some parallels we found between Hamas and Israel. Yes, especially the video of people dancing and drumming. It motivated some students to sign up for drumming lessons at our school. Yes, they enjoyed all the experiences. They loved learning about the other parts of the world and my newcomer students, I think especially enjoyed the experiences. They saw a thing or two that reminded them of some of their cultures. Did you discuss the Burundi, that the genocide that happened in Burundi? Yes, was sad, but kids really understood the leaders were to blame for influencing others how important it is to stand up for what is right. Yes, but brought it to their level, more around bullying and taking from people because of greed. We did discuss some of the sad history and about bullying. Yes, I was just honest about it. I don't think it's clicking anymore. Can you do it, Sharon? I don't think. It's slide 11. That one, yeah. But what will the kids remember? These comments were from third and fourth graders. I will remember how they make bowls. <laughs> the Burundi can speak a couple of languages. I will remember the music and the dancing and what the grass and trees look like. The beautiful water and beautiful sky and the plants they grow. The genocide part, which was very bad of the government the genocide that happened and lots of people got killed and was taking stuff. That slide. Um, one more, Sharon, it's the last one. Yeah, that one. So we raised $341.49. Um, but before I came yesterday, the clerk gave me a check for $400 because her and her sister put in 60 extra dollars, which means, yeah. Um, so just so you know, uh, $341 converts to 974,000 Burundian francs. So the fact that we have 400 American dollars is well over a million Burundian francs. Um, we are in the process of getting the money to the CRV, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Burundi. So 
destiny, wherever you're at at the moment. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for inspiring me and the teachers at my school to make a change because Africa is beautiful and our students need to know the beauty and the pain. Thank you. Um, wow. And usually at this point is when um, the facilitator does some witty intellectual collection of everything everybody says, but I say drop the mic. I don't think I have anything to add to that. So I would like everyone to stand up in this incredible team of students, the most wonderful round of applause that they deserve. We love you. You're amazing. You're family now. And thank you what you've given to NEIU, what you've given to Burundi, and what you're giving to the world. I am very hopeful, that word of hope, that the next generation got this. Um, so I'll open it up for any questions that you might have. Ah, and I think Dr. Interrogator has something to say. Any questions? Yeah. Thank you so much for your personal stories and um, sharing how much you've learned and the, I could hear some of the vulnerability in what you were sharing. And so it really um, was very impactful in that extra way. I just wanted to ask uh, this morning, I saw some of you uh, putting that up. I just, I was curious what that was. Um, that is one of the colleagues at my school chose to make a mural about Burundi. So that is actually from the hallway of my school. Wow. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Chris. Thank you for all, all your presentations. They're really inspiring and amazing. Um, and I wonder, you know, there's not really any way to prepare for a trip like this. I know that. But if you can think of something that might help, because, you know, this is, we're learning as faculty, what is the best way to work with students as they encounter this material for the first time? So any thoughts that you have about how we can do a better job to prepare you and or maybe something during the trip that would help you cope with some of the material that you're learning. Thank you. I think um, I think the professors were dynamic in getting us ready. Uh, everything they told us was correct. Um, they told us health-wise what to do to get ready. Um, they told us um, about what to expect from the people. Um, they told us about our accommodations. They really totally, truly prepared us. Something else, uh, the topic that we were researching was extremely heavy. So we had a healing ceremony and that helped out a lot and it resolved all any conflict um, and it caused people to kind of digest what we were experiencing daily. I'm not sure if there's anything online. Oh, I see Justinia's hand up, actually. You want to go ahead? I wanted to say it was really a team effort. Um, one day, one person could be strong and the other one wasn't. And we were there just as a family, as a team, just supporting each other. There was times where we would get physically sick, sick to our stomach to hear the stories, to see the horrific things. And I think everyone was just extremely supported. We all, we would take breaks, we would get hugs, we would get words of encouragement, of motivation. And I just think that really made a difference because we could prepare each other so much before the trip, but you just don't know what you're going to encounter. A lot of times it triggers even our own traumas that we might not even think about when we're going to see things like this. So I just think to have a support system like the one we did and to create a family like we did really helped out in this trip. Thank you. I wanna say that I kind of came late to the game because at first um, my principal told me I couldn't go. 
And uh, unless I found somebody that had the same qualifications of me as me, which was kind of hard because I have an early childhood endorsement and a teaching, obviously I'm a teacher. Um, so it was really helpful for me that the team had recorded their previous Zoom meetings. So even though I wasn't part of the group yet, I had something to watch and listen to people's questions. And um, that was really helpful to prepare me before I got on board and met everyone. Anybody else has a question, a comment? So why do you think about your comments and uh, questions? Thank you, thank you. Um, this is a very proud moment for me to hear each of you reflect on this journey. And it's it's really amazing, the learning experience and how different everything is for each of you. And this is why we love travel, right? You will never teach a person this in any classroom. You could read any books, you can talk to anybody, but being present in a space is completely a different kind of learning in so many aspects. So I know that it's it's a very, and we've been saying this, all right, it's, like, it's a very heavy stuff. So be prepared uh, and make sure that you take care of yourself, right? So what did you do to preserve yourself, for self-care, to prevent secondary trauma, mm. right? Because as a senior said, there are certain things we may not even recognize about ourselves that travel literally make us reflect on. So that's, the, I usually say this, you know, whenever I travel, I discover more about myself, who I am as a person. And that's your personal journey. So how did you do it? Because I think each of you have accomplished so much through these reflections. Um, it's good to know. So, you know, you know, next time in our next journey, we might tell our students, maybe, you know, do ABC as um, self-care, you know, after this trip, or what can we do better to facilitate that? Because that is the problem, right? It's always, we do care about our people, you know, who give us the stories, it's re-traumatizing them definitely. And as students witnessing, anybody witnessing this journey and the stories, whether we like it or not, we're reliving it somehow. It's different, but we are doing that. So give us some tips because you all look good. <laughs> 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 okay. okay. I was, I'll go and then you, Victor. Um, I haven't stopped really. Um, I think that for me, I need to, when I see something, I want to do something. And so throwing myself into the school and focusing on the beauty was helpful for me. Um, in the same way that looking at the photos that Victor took was cathartic in a way, um, I was, I went to the opening and I was really, I really brought people with me because I wanted them to see what I had experienced because I don't think I've, I haven't been able to say it. Like to this person, I said this, or to this person, I said this. And then one day to my boyfriend, I just started and there was this and this and this. And he looked at me, he's like, whoa, where'd that come from? I'm like, I don't know, <laughs> but through art, I think we can reflect on it. And I hope that the Spurundian travelers that I have with me, that we can stay connected and for future groups to go, that they can stay connected and that we can continue together to share our feelings and our art with the world. Artist. Thank you, Thank you Sarah. Um, uh, that's a very good question, Dr. Isedu. Um, I, I would usually say I would go by the book and use 5P, perfect preparation, protects poor presentation. And uh, Dr. Janine, um, before the trip, uh, organized several meetings with the um, 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 research trip. 
where they explain a lot of information about um, um, uh, Burundi itself, about, um, I'll say, climate. Uh, you know, it's hot. Uh, we're going to be traveling a lot, so the trip will be physically demanding as well. Um, uh, the, 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 the best way for me was uh, or what I did at the beginning, and I'm still not sure if I, if I made a mistake or not. I went to internet, I went to YouTube University, and try to see any videos on Burundi, literally everything. I read all the, uh, you know, CIA reports, anything that I could find. And the moment I stepped in Burundi, I realized that that actually um, was a mistake since they present a narrative that might not be um, um, what uh, my eyes are seeing over there. Um, so my point is once you get there, you might be able to get a more accurate image of what happens. Um, I, together with uh, Colette and Sarah, ran the tech team, which had additional responsibility uh, to prepare the teams and the necessary equipment for interviews. So we had uh, several um, 2 a.m., 3 a.m. nights, um, um, but um, all of that is very, very unimportant at the moment because we are um, very happy to see the fruit of our work there. Um, I think, I think, uh, um, I, I think it's um, Yesenia mentioned, um, just support each other over there. Um, the, the, the second part is uh, is the interviews and the content, the responses we're listening from the interviewees, which adds um, um, a, 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 you know, a, a huge emotional responsibility from us. Um, uh, so I, I do think that uh, the, the key is to, to, to the answer is to stay together, um, healing circles, we did um, um, several of them over there are also very helpful. <clears throat> I just wanted to add um, insect repellent. <laughs> you could never have too much. That's a practical solution for some practical situations. We were stri sh literally stripped of our privilege and how we adjusted to that individually was uh something amazing to watch maybe we should have recorded that <laughs> because we were strapped down we were in tiny places um we probably got to know each other more than we might have wanted to <laughs> and so i just think keeping the connection like uh, victor said um or sarah after is extremely important for future trips and um sharing our, our experiences because we broke down a lot we had like little mini tantrums um because <laughs> you know it's like where's the cold the hot water you know <laughs> and so I, it, there is no preparation for something like this other than speaking with um our professors something i would like to say is um we had two people to lose their luggage and one of my friends had traveled um, internationally and she told me, make sure you keep at least a week's worth of clothing in your carry on. So I think that's an extremely important tip <laughs> because it took them like two to three days to get their luggage and they were kind of sad. And I hated seeing them mope around and I would, I, I would have been upset too. So yeah, <laughs> I I have to add that I was probably the only one that didn't follow the that recommendation, and I lost my luggage. So, <laughs> yeah, it is a good idea. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, if if I may add something else, just um, I mean, this is a prime example of how um different realities exposed to same experience lead to very different outcomes. Um, so just, um, we, we had to be, um, open-minded, um, and, and let, let the experience come, come through us, um, and, and really live it. Um, and, and I think we all did on our own way and, and we got so much from it. So yeah, that's it. Wow.
You know, okay, let me say this. I had the hardest times with the mass graves. And I was so happy that people were there to support me because a lot of times I had to step away. Sometimes I didn't want to get off the bus, but I knew I was there for research. Um, but people really surrounded me and helped me through that because that was really difficult for me. And I thought I could do anything because I come from a background of child welfare. But that was difficult. Any other questions, comments? Yes. yes. <laughs> no hesitation at all on that one. Yes. Absolutely. Is there anything yeah. in the chat? Is Maybe. there any comments in the chat? I see. I see one sitting there. I'm not sure if that's a comment or a question. Ah, gotcha. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Someone ju just told me, um, you selected the best. <laughs> um, I don't know if we select them or if you guys selected us, but really the experience was amazing to watch all of you literally transform. I start with the, the tech team, the dream team, as they came to be very quickly. We, I didn't know what your skills were, but you just instantly, the first meeting we had, training meeting, they just got together. This is the dream team. I tried to indicate who does what, that didn't work, but they just really together, just defined themselves, their roles, and went to work. I didn't even know what to assign to them. They just figured out all by themselves. I had this little, I bought things I thought they were amazing or they end up not working and so but they just gave me a list I mean, it was beautiful it went seamlessly that's why we're able to bring back amazing work the stories and like quality wise it was really beautiful work this time around um the other thing I'm, I wanted to say about each of you how committed you were mm -hmm. to the work absolutely Asha. that was incredible just to watch all of you stick with it mm -hmm. for the story like you wanted that story i don't think i've ever seen anything right. like it so faculty members yes of course you know that's what they do that they are scholars but to see students walk in as you heard all not knowing what they were going like what, yeah. what to encounter what they were going to encounter but they just stuck with it. It was hard. Absolutely. It, you know, it was wet. It was cold. It was everything. But they stuck with it, kept going. And that's why we brought beautiful stories beautiful. to share with the world. You know, um, the other thing I wanted to add to this is earlier on, someone asked questions uh, about how, I think a couple of questions actually about this, where um, they asked what can be done you know, what can be done, what can the young people do, what can the youth do to really fight social injustice? So how to fight this gen these genocides, right? How do we prevent them? This is it. Yeah, yeah. This is it. Absolutely. You heard their stories. I mean, the poem from Colette, the amazing exhibit from Victor, right? And Sarah, the work a whole week on Ubuntu, galvanized the whole school. I'm telling you, when she first told me about this, it's like, oh, come on. You think a school would stop what they are doing to just involve Burundi? And they sure did. She got them all. I mean, these teachers were committed. I, when I walked in, these kids all walking in with these flags of Burundi. They have each child with a flag waving and they're just coming in. It's like, what's happening? So a whole auditorium filled with these flags. So when they said that they had some, a good point or something, they would just wave all these flags, clapping and waving the flag. It was beautiful. Um, and to hear their questions. So this is really important. Young children asking pertinent questions. I was like, where am I? Um, some of the questions were challenging. I couldn't have, you know, good answers for them. Um, so planting a seed like that in a school, I can, I, my hope is that uh, one child from those children 
could one day say, ah, he heard of Burundi in my elementary school and maybe get more inquisitive, you know, more curious, right? That's what we hope for, yeah. And then Crystal, when we first met, when she mentioned Teresa Oklahoma, I said, boom, that's it. That connection is very important because that was an economic, right? At the base, there was an economic element which also ties to the Burundi situation because people, may, some people were killed because they were rich, actually not some, many were killed because they were rich and the property was taken by those the, the perpetrators, right? I, I truly, I mean, it, it, the comparison to me was very important and I hope you keep thinking about that as you move forward. You know, and then Katina comes in and say, I, you know, I still believe that you are an amazing uh, tech, tech person. Although you kept saying, no, I don't know. She was trained in a minute and she was just on it. So professional. I was watching you and you kept saying, I don't know what I'm doing. I said, yes, you do. You look professional to me, right? So, but the idea, but you, you were passionate about getting to interview, getting to the stories themselves directly. And that really touched me. That was very important, you know? So thank you. And then Camilo, I tell you honestly, it's only today that I just heard the direct connection. I knew he said, he did tell me, oh yeah, we have my past in, uh, in Colombia, but we didn't get into the detail. You shocked me by how you directly connected Burundi to Colombia and made it, in it's personal. There's a personal story and that's really beautiful. So I thank you so much, but I'm going to reveal a secret, a secret to all of you. So the way many of, so I think it's a Victor, no, some, anyway, one of you mentioned the morning conversations, right? And it's many, table talks. The what? Kitchen table talks. Oh, okay. kitchen table <laughs> talks. Yes, in the morning. So I I don't think I participated in any of them. Why? So the, when I got, when I think on the plane, I says, I approached the, uh, Jermaine. I said, Jermaine, I'm going to land as a survivor. I will not be a professor. I will not be a scholar. I'm just landing as a survivor. Please, can you take over? And just take it. And you all saw things running smoothly. And yeah, there he was. He absolutely beautifully performed. So please help me thank him. We all had no idea that there was a plan, you know, uh, that things were smooth. So he organized those morning uh, conversations that were beautiful, informative. Um, connect, helping you connect that, that was really wonderful. And all the faculty members who were with us, you guys were amazing in supporting us, stepping up. When things were improvised, you were all there. So please help me thank Lisa, uh, I said to uh, Sharon, uh, wait, what, what am I missing? So Jermaine, oh, I'm the one, I'm fifth. I was counting five. <laughs> I was counting five, yes. So thank you all so much for being troopers, for really sticking with it so that we end up with amazing, amazing products. So, um, so I don't know if any of the faculty members want to say anything else, but again, I can't thank you enough for, to, for what you brought to the world. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. And just remember, everybody, we're not free to everybody's free. They're calling for ceasefire. We need a ceasefire for the world. And I always want to ask the question, why are there only gen certain genocides? And I'm going to go ahead and say it because as I mentioned, black and brown genocides are not put out there. Right? Why? Right? So we need to call a ceasefire for the world. Not when just one section is all bad. But we need to call it ceasefire for the world and talk about our humanity because love always knows its way home, right, y'all? Yeah, absolutely. And so um, I love you guys. It was an amazing journey. I would love to do it again and again and again and again with you, right? And um, I'm so honored to touch. I learned so much. And um, with that, if there's any other comments. I thought Jermaine was um, grabbing the mic. <laughs> Are you coming up here? Yes, of course. It would have been the same if you had none. <laughs> so
So I'll use a uh, speaker authority to say I'm kind of disappointed in the presentations because no one mentioned a phrase that we used every single day on our trip. Absolutely not. <laughs> that, that, that phrase was, we use that phrase every <laughs> single day of our trip. And how could we forget the uh, Bath and Body Works fragrances? It saved us. Uh, but truly, this has been an amazing three days. It went by pretty quickly, uh, but it was full of reflection, meaningful conversation, a special keynote, a wonderful exhibit, fascinating and engaging panels, but most importantly, we understood the assignment. We all did. Uh, every presentation, every panel, every speaker, including this latest panel, certainly provides an important tribute to those who went ahead of us. Uh, it, it's important that in the ancestral circle, we understand the power of the past, present, and future. And so we are grateful for the opportunity to have uh, been in existence for these 10 years and to have utilized this or conference as a way of reflecting on the reality that never again uh, has become so much of a cliche that we've not added meaning to resolution to ensure that never again involves everywhere in the world and never again uh, requires strong, decisive action. And there can be no peace without justice. And so while we reflect on the reality of genocides, let us also reflect on our individual responsibility in engaging those that have the power to change. And those people are us. Uh, it's important that as we looked at the reflection during this conference that we engaged on notions of power without ever interrogating the problems of defining power simply from a Eurocentric perspective. That when we engage power, we are engaging not just the ability to do, but the ability to be. So much of our African humanism is lost because it has been stuffed into notions and standards that we didn't create. And I think that is why the space of GRAD is so important, mm -hmm. that we can create a viable space, that we can talk about the trauma that has been visited upon people of African descent, and we can also talk about the freedom that comes from owning our trauma and from engaging our own trauma. And so, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to bring this conference to a wonderful close. Thank you very much for being here these three days and thank you for engaging us these three days. We are grateful, we greatly appreciate it. I want to say same time, same place, but next year, uh, but we may have to have a bigger space to have our conference because I anticipate partnership with the state and with other organizations so that the world knows what we have learned here today. Thank you very much. I was told I was paid for more than I just did, so I have one more thing to do. That's the boss. She 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 pays me. So it gives me great pleasure. I listened in a very unassuming but very powerful way. Uh, Dr. Ewelina Ochab. She did a very fascinating and wonderful presentation talking about the history, the historical context, and the importance of understanding the tradition of genocide prevention the legal framework, but also the need to create greater political will for the resolution and prevention of genocide. And for that, Dr. Ochab, we thank you very much. And here it is, please come here for this token of our appreciation for having been our keynote speaker. We are gratefully appreciative of your participation. And how could we finish 
the remarks without saying in Kirundi, Urakozi Chane. <laughs> Thank you very much. Please mull around, take pictures, and enjoy the wonderful ambience of the work being finished. Thank you. That was so ridiculously amazing. Thank that was you. so amazing. Thank you. <laughs>